Oh, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Gina Maria Coberl, and I uh, want to welcome you here. Thank you for coming to worship with us on this holiday weekend. Uh, your presence is appreciated. Let us begin with a opening prayer. I'm going to take a little bit from a prayer by Anselm. Let us pray. O oh God, let me seek you in my desire. Let me desire you in my seeking. Let me find you by loving you, and let me love you when I find you. Amen. I invite you to please stand as you are able, and let us confess and receive the gift of forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Please take a moment of silent reflection. Eternal God, our Creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have the peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were yet still sinners. And for his sake, God forgives you all of your sins. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take this time to share the peace with one another.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. And also Let us pray. O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words by justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Fresh from the young and 
The first lesson is just a minute. The first lesson is from the 28th chapter of Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent that prophet. The word of the Lord. My mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your steadfast love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your life forever, and preserve your for all generations. Happy are the people who know the feastal shout. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. The second lesson is from the sixth chapter of Romans. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from things which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. 
Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated, and I invite the children to come forward. Well, good morning. Hi. I have a question for you. So what is a gift? What? When do we get gifts? When do you give or receive gifts? Christmas. Yep. Is there another times that you do? Birthdays. Yeah, those are kind of big times that we receive gifts. Yeah. And sometimes they're wrapped like this one. But what you got to do to get to the gift? What do you got to do? Oh, to get to it, if it comes to you like this, got to open it up, right? Unwrap it. Yeah, there's actually nothing in here. But that's the idea. I want you to keep the idea of gifts in mind. So in the story today, or in the reading today, Jesus said, that people who shared God's love and healing and words were called prophets, okay? And if you welcomed a prophet into your home, that you would receive a reward. And what he's talking about is that we can have gifts, right, that are things, something in here, Right, but another way that there's gifts is people can be gifts to each other. So when we welcome a person who's sharing healing and love and words of God, we are actually welcoming Jesus as well, a gift. And so I want you to remember that when you, we can receive gifts, in other people. People can be gifts to each other, just like a gift wrapped up like this. And when we are being a gift to another person, that's a pretty cool thing too. So I want you to pray with me. Repeat after me. Dear God, God, thank you for Jesus who teaches us how to be your gift. By receiving and then sharing your healing, love, and words. Amen. Have a seat. The title of today's sermon is, You Gotta Serve Somebody. We're continuing to look at the letter to the Romans that Paul wrote to the Romans. He'd never met them, so this is basically a letter that summarizes all of his thoughts and theories and teachings that he'd accumulated after 20 years of missionary work for Jesus. Chapter 6 is really about freedom. And a great poet in American history summed it up very well. 
Years ago, Bob Dylan explored Christianity, and he experimented with an album called Slow Train Coming. In Slow Train Coming, he wrote a lot of Christian-themed songs, and one of those songs was played on the radio quite a bit. It's called You Gotta Serve Somebody. The verse and chorus of that song, one of the verses, goes like this. Might like to wear cotton, might like to wear silk, might like to drink whiskey, might like to drink milk, might like to eat caviar, you might like to eat bread. You may be sleeping on the floor, sleeping in a king-sized bed, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil and it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. One night when he was on tour, he sang that song, and the crowd began to boo. And the more he sang, the louder and more that they booed, and finally he just left the stage. And following the show, one of the concert goers approached him and said, I didn't come here to hear that kind of baloney. I'm free. I don't serve anybody but myself. In the letter to the Romans, Paul addresses this nature of freedom. What does it mean to be free? Paul identifies freedom as obedience. Obedience to the will of God. So our freedom is in being freely obedient. Now, most Americans, I think, would define freedom as independence. The freedom to do whatever we want, as we want to listen to who and what we want to serve ourselves. Yet, if we really take inventory, we may find that we think we are free. Meanwhile, a whole lot of people are telling us what to do, where to go, and what to buy. According to Paul, humans are never not under obligation to something. He writes in Romans 6, 16, You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Paul tells us in Romans 6 that when we come to Christ by faith, when we are baptized into Christ, then we are buried to the old way of life, and we're raised into a whole new way of life. Our whole orientation in life is switched and shifted. It's like once being a slave to the master called sin and then undergoing a total change of ownership, a change of identity. And now we belong to Christ. If you were here last week, that may sound familiar because in chapter 5, just before this chapter, Paul explains how our identity is now in Christ. That all those things we use to identify ourselves, nationality, our family, our advantages, our disadvantages, all these things, that we claim are who we are, are wiped away and wiped clean and replaced with only one word, Christ. We are now in Christ. And now in chapter 6, he is saying, in our service to something, our obedience to something, that something 
is Christ. That our freedom is in being freely obedient. Okay. So if that is so, why do we still sin? Romans 6.21 says, So what advantage did you get from the things you are now ashamed? When I hear this, I think of the foolish acts of very powerful people. It seems to plaster the news every once in a while. People who believe that their power and their prestige enable them in some way to do anything. The definition of freedom. But ultimately, it leads to a really big mess. See, no matter who you are, whether you are a person in a powerful position of prestige or just an ordinary Jane and Joe trying to make the month's rent and living paycheck to paycheck, there are certain things that can run us. And these things distract us from our higher thoughts. And they can pull us out of integrity bit by bit. Sometimes so slowly, so little by little, we don't even notice we're being pulled out of integrity until there's a mess. So what advantage did you get from the things you are now ashamed of? When this topic of sin comes up, many people tend to think of behavior. The Bible doesn't frame sin as just a moral category, a list of prohibited actions. The essence of sin defined in the Bible is when the human mind and heart turn in on itself. That's the essence of sin. The Ten Commandments, the lists of prohibited acts, those are ways to help us stay focused on our Master Jesus. But the true nature of sin is when we turn our minds and hearts in on ourselves. When we live under the power of our own will and our own desires and not under the power of God. So the issue of sin, it's bigger than just following a list of rules to be good people. It's about our total orientation of our lives. What's running us? We are going to serve somebody. And our freedom is in who we choose to serve. The question's not whether we're going to follow something or someone, but what and who will we follow? Dr. David Loos wrote in workingpreacher.org this commentary I want to share with you. The contemporary understanding of freedom misleads us into believing that if you are lucky or strong or bold or beautiful or powerful enough, you can live absent of any obligations, any commitments, any requirements whatsoever. But Paul invites the Christian Romans and, by extension, all of us, To consider that the choice before us is not whether or not to be oriented, to be obedient or free. That's not the choice. But rather to what we will be freely obedient. Further, Paul knows that a human nature tends to slide toward whatever seems easiest in the short run. And be sacrificing short-term gratification for long-term happiness is really difficult. 
Therefore, he promises that God has granted to us the freedom in Christ to strive for things that bring long-term happiness and eternal blessings. Paul believes, that is, that God has granted us the power to aspire to and achieve more than our surroundings and our culture offers. I especially like what the Message Bible translates for Romans 6, 22 to 23, the next two verses after the question in verse 21 about, about what benefit have we received. It says, but now that you've found you don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do and have discovered the delight of listening to God telling you, what a surprise! A whole and healed, put together life right now and more and more of life in the way. Work hard for sin and the your whole life and your pension is death, but God's gift is real life, eternal life delivered by Jesus our Master. The key there is service to sin, the turning in toward ourselves and our own desires is work. And the pension plan is death. But God gives a gift not work, a gift. You may be freely obedient to the work of our will or to the gift of God's new life for us, God's gift of second chances, of changed lives, of new beginnings. The good news is that God has the will to empower us. When we are obedient to God's will, that will empowers us. See how that works? The gift. It empowers us more than we can imagine, more than our surroundings or life conditions reveal to us in the moment. So let's get back to that concert goer. The one who spoke about his thoughts about freedom. He thought freedom was a choice between serving and not serving. And let's just get clear, that's a false belief. That's not freedom. It is not a choice between serving and not serving because you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. So our freedom is in being freely obedient. And that is no baloney. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe. Call together in the Spirit's embrace, let us pray for the mending of God's world. We pray for the church, for exiled Christians, oppressed churches, and all who suffer persecution because of faith in you. Deliver freedom, courage, and partners in peacemaking. Hear us, O God. We pray for the earth and its creatures, for sage-grouse, wolverines, and all vulnerable species, for humans and the choices we face. Sustain life and guide our stewardship of all that you have made. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the United States and Canada as we celebrate the founding of our nations, for the President and Prime Ministers, for the Congress and Parliament, Grant wisdom and hearts for justice that all our people flourish. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for those in need, for those who seek jobs, shelter, food, health, and love, for dear ones known to us, especially Frida Morris, Pat Brown, Dan Carlson. Meet their needs by your bountiful compassion in our community's actions. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who worship you today, for wise elders and curious seekers, joyful spirits and burdened souls. Give holy welcome, share tender mercies, and deepen your tr trust in your goodness. Hear us, O God. We give thanks for all who have died in the faith and received the reward of the righteous, especially Janine Burnell Graves and Mary Bielenberg Hill. Bless their memory among us and your life and their life with you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your care through Christ our Lord.
we give thee power. Merciful God, indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should in all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us, Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened, all our, opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the power, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. 
All are welcome to this table of forgiveness to receive this gift of our Lord and Savior. You will receive a piece of bread and then may choose a, from a cup of either dark liquid, which is wine, or light liquid, which is grape juice. There are gluten-free elements available. Just ask the server for that. The ushers will invite you to come forward, and you may kneel or stand along the railings. Please take this moment to reflect, to meditate, and to come forward. The meal is prepared. Let us eat.
Please stand and receive the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace. For you are Lord forevermore. Amen. You may be seated for the announcements. Among our announcements this morning, you will note that the office will be closed on the 4th of July. And uh, so no Bible studies here on that day. Also, we have uh, two events this coming Friday on July 7th that the congregation is invited to. First, on Friday, July 7th at 1 o'clock, you are invited to the marriage ceremony of Megan Engel and Scott Jackson. And then that evening at 6 o'clock, there will be a memorial service followed by sharing in the Journey of God's Gifts event from 6.30 to 8.30 for Mary Bielenberg Hill. And the Messiah congregation is invited to her celebration of life as well. There are no other announcements from the congregation. Let us rise and receive the blessing. Now may the power of God strengthen you. May the love of Jesus Christ heal you. And may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you, now and forever. Amen.
Guided by the gospel, we welcome all to worship. Go in peace, serve the Lord.